Next up, we have Sarah Hashkis, who will be talking about psychedelics and immersive technology, a pathway towards collective consciousness. Sarah Hashkis, CEO of Radix Motion, is utilizing her research in cognitive neuroscience and psychedelics to create 3D human movement data channels. She is trying to disrupt the way we interface with technology using an embodied cognition approach that focused on users' well being and ability to foster a deeper connection that can only be reached through physical interactions. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to SEP. Hi, I'm unmuting myself and starting my video. Um, hi, everyone. I can still see the screen share. Uh, great. Now I can share my screen. Um, are you getting my screen? I think we need to unshare. You're it. not getting your screen. We can see you, though. Yeah, so I think we, oh, here we go. Yeah, we needed to wait until the other person was on. Okay, screen seen right now? Yes, yep. Great. So hi everyone, thanks for joining. If you've been sitting in front of a computer for a while, uh, I would recommend standing up, shaking your body for like 10 seconds before um, you sit back down so we get some blood flow and connect to our bodies because a lot of this um, little lecture I'm giving today is about how we can create a collective consciousness through our connectivity to our bodies and each other's bodies. Uh, I'm going to be asking you questions. We're going to reverse this a little bit at points of the conversation. Um, and you can press, there's a little button uh, that says raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. Um, so when I ask questions, you can raise your hand and I'll try to give a little bit of a tally uh, and we can see if we get some answers. So uh, my first question to you all is, how many of you have experienced trauma around math? pain, fear, anxiety around your math abilities. Who here came into contact with math teachers that might not have been supportive or parents or siblings? So anyone wanna raise their hand? I, I can, I'm gonna join in on this. Let's see how I can see if you're raising your hand or not. Let's see if I see the participants. Yeah, so I'm getting six people, seven. Great, so definitely uh, we're talking about currently around 48 participants, so um, a significant amount of us. Now I'm bringing this up because uh, parts of my talk are gonna be very embedded in the scientific ideas and in math. So first I wanna recognize that sometimes um, these types of trauma and fears can really uh, get us to not listen and be just like freeze when we see equations. So in order to try to convince you that math is magic, I'm going to show you um, a video of one of my favorite mathematicians. Um, he has a whole series of videos called Three Blue, One Brown. And hopefully this will convince you that math is the best language we have to understand complex relationships, model them, and actually utilize this to build systems and understand them. So let's go. One minute. Um, are you getting audio? Oh, okay. So uh, I'll also, I'm not sure if you're getting audio, but I can explain the video. This is a video explaining the relationship uh, that you might have if you're in love with somebody who's avoidant. So if you are in love with somebody and you're actually connecting to them, the more they connect to you, we get this type of equation that is dependent on the other person's connection to you. But if that other person is avoided and actually the closer you get to them, they move away from you, we get a different type of differential equation, which we can then model in this amazing graph that can show people's behavior. Um, so this is a little bit of really a demo that math is relevant. It's not just about things that are, you know, the things we were taught in, in most of our classes. Uh, and this is a framework that can help us when we come to understand complex systems like our own brain or like um, collective consciousness that we'll be getting to. So what does a brain do? Um, the whole talk I'm giving right now is embedded within the predictive coding theory that looks at the brain as a prediction machine that doesn't have actually any information about the outside world. We're this thing in a box that's getting sensory input. Um, now, we have a vast number of neurons 
86 billion. That's a really, really large number, more than stars in the galaxy. Um, and not all of them are equal. They really specialize and they are in different parts of the hierarchy of the brain. We have very different structures. Some structures process simple signals like uh, your visual system or your auditory system. And some structures uh, start bringing these information sources together and actually process multimodal information. Um, now, the really important and unique thing about the predictive coding framework is that it doesn't just look at the current information that's coming from your senses right now. It actually explains that your brain is using whatever you have already learned. Uh, we call this in neuroscience priors or predictions or biases, right? A lot, a lot of names. The scientific community is always um, debating and creating new languages, which can sometimes be a barrier. But basically, whatever your brain has already learned is constantly being combined from whatever you're experiencing right now. Um, and I think the best way to is just to experience this, right? Because we can talk about this, but I'd like to give you a sensory experience of what does it mean to have biases. So uh, here's a famous uh, Margaret Tath Thatcher illusion. We're seeing Margaret Thatcher uh, upside down. Awesome, right? Now I'm going to turn the photo around and whoa, what just happened here? This is exactly the same photo. I just rotated it. Um, but when I rotated it, suddenly one of the photos looks really warped and distorted. Why is that? Well, our brains are used to seeing upright uh, faces, right? So our bias towards upright faces is much stronger. We can see differences in upright faces. We weren't trained. We didn't get data of upside down faces. So we don't see the difference uh, between that as, as much. So you can see really that the previous information and your bias your brain has affects your perception to that level. I'm just gonna go through this again. Wow, same pictures, right? Nope, totally work. So our brain is incredibly, incredibly um, confusing sometimes. And I think it's really an important part for us to understand these biases. Uh, especially in the social context that we are in right now, right? Um, so our biases are based on early life conditions. And not always were these conditions the most accurate or relevant to our current life, to our actual belief systems. Um, sometimes uh, these biases can actually be very harmful for ourselves or for others. Uh, I'm going to give just a, a unique and sort of crazy example of how these biases actually work. So at a certain time in your development stage, uh, different parts of your brain become extensively plastic learning, and then they sort of close down and become this, this bias and the construct that your brain has learned. Um, one of the things that has happened is if you've ever played with these toy magnets of the alphabet that have colors in them, uh, enough kids have actually gotten synesthesia, which means they see the letters with an overlay of the colors because they were exposed to these magnets at a certain developmental stage. And it's not everyone, but it's enough of a phenomena to understand how important um, data to young brains is, right? Uh, now, this is a case where you might say, okay, that maybe it's actually beneficial. Maybe it helps them read. Maybe it, it's confusing their reading skills. I'm not sure. There hasn't been enough research on this, uh, but it's not so um, important. However, a lot of other things are. Um, and this brings me to my second question that I'm gonna ask you. Um, raise your hand if you think you still have biases in your brain that might be hurting yourself or others. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely gonna raise my hand on this. Um, we're getting so far four hand raises. Uh, five, okay, growing. Um, and I'm bringing this up because uh, eight, jumping, great. Um, so I'm bringing this up because the first thing we need to do is identify these biases within ourselves, accept that they're there, not be ashamed of them, not be defensive if we want to actually start fixing them. And I put even this cute photo here to just show how much bias is in our early lives. You can see this is an extremely gendered photo, right? Pink, uh, uh, female presenting young baby with holes in her ears that she likely didn't choose versus a blue shirted male. So these things are very, very present in our social structures, embedded into our brain from a very, very early age. And then 
The good news is we can actually change this, okay? And this is where a lot of psychedelics and immersive technology can actually assist us with this, which we're gonna get to. So let's say we've identified a bias and we wanna change it. How does that work? So the good news is that surprise is our best bet and our best sort of thing that can help us actually change our belief system. Um, surprise or in neuroscience lingo, this is called prediction error is an event where your brain cannot actually uh, um, compromise these two signals, right? You might know something from your previous bias, your history, your childhood, but whatever is coming into your senses right now doesn't fit what you were taught. Now your brain starts to get this massive amount of prediction error, which it starts funneling into different parts of your brain. But if it still can't actually minimize this prediction error, a model will be updated, your bias will be updated. So this is great news for us uh, because this means that we are still plastic and we can still change. Um, I wanna give you an example of how sometimes it is very easy to change very strong biases. For instance, what is yourself? What is your body? Uh, this seems to be like, wow, of course I know what my body is, but it turns out that at least uh, for many people, maybe not everyone, they're seeing that there's some difference between the population, but many people that experience an experiment that's called the rubber hand experiment, which you might have heard of, you take a rubber hand like you see in the picture, and you sim stimulate the rubber hand at the same frequency that you stimulate your own hand. Um, for many people, that rubber hand will start feeling as if it's their hand. And it's not just a subjective feeling, this is measurable. They take a big hammer, come and squash the rubber hand, and you can see massive spikes um, in the actual person, and they scream. You know, it's, it's actually a very physiological effect where you can act, believe this rubber hand is you just because we have correlated the statistical information between the hand and your and a rubber hand, right? That's just the best explanation for your brain to correlate the statistical signals. Oh, that must be my body now, let's update it. That's the only explanation we can come up with. So this is really interesting. Now we're gonna get to the next question. Um, hopefully based on all this information that I gave, 86 billion neurons, levels of hierarchy, um, sections of bias, we can start are seeing our own system, just each and every one of us as a collective. Um, and this is something that I'm incredibly interested in. I think this has massive positive effects for our own uh, social, well, um, social and mental well-being. Um, and I'd like to ask you, how many of you have actually given a name to at least one sub-agent or intoned voice that you have? Um, for instance, with me, I call um, some of the parts like munchkins. They're like the baby parts that grumble and like food. Um, maybe you have other parts that represent uh, possibly a loved one that has passed away or even something like Jesus in your life, right? Um, all these things that can really affect us uh, give and take agency from the whole system. So question, um, how many of you have this in their lives? Okay, I'm getting seven, eight, eight people right now um, voting. That's awesome. That's, yeah, um, eight out of 46. Those are nice numbers. Thanks for interacting. This is super interesting to me, and I would love to start gathering more data of, on these things. Now, we're going to move into the psychedelic section and see how psychedelics can help us unbias ourselves and create a larger collective and understanding within uh, our social and interpersonal dynamics. So first, really TLDR about psychedelics. Um, we're, I am currently talking about the specific classical psychedelics that bind to the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor, which we're seeing in this cool image right here. Um, so when psychedelics bind to the receptor, uh, this makes the neuron that this receptor is on more likely to fire. This is the mechanism that's been known for quite some time around psychedelics. But what does that actually mean? Okay, we have some neurons that are more likely to fire. Uh, how does that actually affect the whole system? So I'm going to give you a metaphor about what your brain is doing and what psychedelics does to your brain. Imagine your brain is actually building sandcastles. Remember this metaphor from before, our, the past information is actually your buckets, right? There's buckets that are your biases, the knowledge that you already have, and there's a constant inflow of sand that is coming from your sensory information. And your brain is just taking the sand and putting buckets on it, creating your reality. 
right? Consciousness and perception is actually a creative process. It's not like a passive thing. Um, so what happens, oh yeah, this is the explanation, sand is the current signals and buckets is your past biases. Now, what psychedelics do is they actually break down your brain's buckets. Instead of having a few sort of big buckets and you can just dump all the sand in, your buckets start breaking into weird shapes, smaller shapes, and whatever they actually do, they're, they constantly, they're trying to build this new reality with these smaller and weird shaped buckets, you're getting an overflow of sand, an overflow that your brain can't actually predict. Um, so an overflow of prediction error in your brain. That's the side effect of psychedelics, which then increases plasticity and creates all these other effects that we'll briefly touch upon. Um, but just to show you how this neurocircuit actually looks like, so this is a cortical column in your brain. Um, all our cortex is covered with very similar structure that is layered in these, um, in these layers, and we can actually track the information flow coming from different areas and sort of looping back and creating these feedback loops. And we can see that the 5-HT2A receptor is specifically on specific neurons in a specific layer. It's not distributed all over the brain equally. It's in a very specific place that is actually on these green, the backwards connections, right, that represent the buckets. <coughs> Sorry. So, these are the neurons that are getting um, uh, overly activated and diffusing these buckets, turning them into smaller buckets. This is from my paper uh, from 2017. Um, I'm really happy to see more and more um, really top-notch cognitive neuroscience, Robin Carter and Harris and Kristen setting this paper, coming out with very um, similar theories uh, about what is happening to the brain. And we can see that basically, the, in, in my paper, I call this predictions, but we can again call them buckets or priors, get broken down into decomposed, smaller um, predictions that then create an overload of prediction error. Okay, hopefully you managed to follow this. If not, I have a, there's a lot of lectures and resources that I will be happy to share so you can have the time to actually delve into this on a deeper level. Um, now we're seeing, um, you might have seen this image many times uh, in the psychedelic community and other conferences. What we're seeing here is fMRI data, uh, so blood flow data, which is very slow. It's on the scale of seconds. While our brain, you know, uh, uh, when we talk about brain waves and, and spikes of neurons, we're talking about much faster uh, frames, like uh, 10 to 80 hertz, um, um, which means yeah, 80 times a second. So when we're starting to look at blood flow movement, on scales of seconds, it's much slower, uh, and it's not directly necessarily correlated to activation. Uh, but what we do see is that in this blood flow data, we're seeing your brain become much more connected and linked. So this is one um, on psychedelics, right? Um, with the theory being that, oh, there's so much prediction error, your brain now has to shove this data into different places to try to understand what's going on. Now, another, this is from a very, very recent paper and very, very interesting paper. I highly recommend um, you, you take time and, and delve into this. I don't have time to like go into the details right now, uh, but this looks at actual brainwave activation um, and, we're, and a specific measurement that I was really hoping in 2017, I was hoping to do this experiment, but didn't get my hands on the data. So I was super excited to see that somebody actually did this. Um, and we are seeing this increase in causality. Causality meaning one area of the brain is not able to predict the activation of another area of the brain. Um, so we're seeing these, these sort of two maybe confl conflicting but actually uh, very interesting things um, that when I take to sort of thinking about what does it mean to have a psychedelic society or to have a psychedelic lifestyle, um, we see this ability when your brain is on psychedelics, the ability of information to flow and transition between different areas of the brain, but we also see each area of the brain being more independent and not actually affecting other brain areas. And I think that could be super, super interesting to think about in our social dynamics, um, right? What if tomorrow I want to go and actually spend some time in a um, Christian community and just dive into that for a bit, right? Why can't we have the freedom to explore deeply different connections, different communities, move between them while actually letting each community 
be its own thing. And these communities not trying to constantly force uh, their belief system on others, right? And this is currently not what I'm seeing in the world. Uh, and most of most communities are very like, you were born into us, now you're gonna be indoctrinated and stay here. And of course, uh, when you try to move between different communities, there's a lot of um, um, disharmony, right? And possibly just thinking about this and thinking about how psychedelics allow us to do this can let us sort of change our wide behavior and create a more harmonic and collective consciousness social experience. Okay, now let's move from this like giant social sphere into just the me and you. Uh, me and, and my personal connection, me and my parents, me and my friend. Um, our connections are built on physical mimicry. Now, if you have kids, you probably know this very, you, you see it. You make a high, you make a face, they, they just mimic you. Right? We have a mirror system in our brain, and this is the, the basics of empathy is mimicry. Um, and, the, and the second thing is that our connection is built on actually modeling each other. The more information, actual information I know about you, what are your biases? What do you like? What do you dislike? What was your childhood? I can start forming a more accurate model about you, predicting you, predicting what is healthy for you, what is hurtful for you, um, and actually creating uh, a better system-wide um, um, connection between us. So th these are the two things um, that I would like people to start thinking about when they start going and, and experiencing the psychedelics. Like what environments uh, and what and who are you exposing yourself to, right, while being on psychedelics? Because very easily, uh, as we've seen when you are in this really plastic state that has destabilized your biases, whatever is coming in right now is retraining you uh, on a very deep level. And who you're with, whoever is, especially if there's some type of like a, a power relationship, if it's a therapist, if it's a shaman guide, can have massive effects on your brain. Um, are they, you know, doing these two things that we were, we were talking about? Are they helping you um, cultivate and connect and model people more, right? Uh, and are they helping you con connect in a physical mimicry way can really, really affect the person you come out of a psychedelic experience. Um, so I have um, um, another question for you now, just to sort of check in on how uh, uh, psychedelics has possibly affected your life. Can you please raise your hand if you have fallen in love with someone while well, on um, psychedelics? So I can raise two hands because it's happened to me twice. <laughs> so I'm gonna give a few seconds. How many people have fallen in love? We're getting eight hands right now. Um, eight people have fallen in love, nine. Okay, this is the, the highest number so far I've got. Um, um, I've fallen in love on psychedelics, right? It's because again, our biases get um, really destabilize and we suddenly can get a deeper model of the other person we can start mimicking them physically and really connect on such a deep level so this is incredibly powerful um, and when i come to think about like okay then how can we do some harm preventation too because these things can go either way you can fall in love with somebody that's extremely really compatible and everything will be awesome or you can find yourself suddenly being in, in really situations that will affect you later on in life, but totally change your personality, um, or at least to a large degree. So I have these three checklists that I personally do that I would like, love to share with you whenever I will do a one-on-one -on -one type of psychedelic ex experience with somebody. First, I will only do it with a person that has a deep practice of consent culture. Right, we are a little bit like babies' brains again. Babies don't have these biases. We are destabilizing our biases, and whoever I'm with has a massive amount of power over me. Right, um, and uh, consent culture is really important. I don't want to find myself not having healthy boundaries with someone in that situation. Um, second, for me, is people that are grounded in scientific thinking with knowledge and abilities that I want. Because I'm making my brain plastic, I can start learning more. Uh, what do I want to learn? And for me, it's very clear. I come from a very religious background and I've managed to slowly take out all these weird baggages that have been stuck in brains of people for 5,000 years. And you know, we've learned since then. And I don't want to get 
uh, ancient knowledge that is not relevant anymore in my brain, personally. So it's a thing I think about a lot. Um, and then uh, the third point is people with healthy self-care practices who are honest about their capabilities. Because it's, again, we are in a more suggestible place. It's very easy to believe people. Uh, and I don't want to find myself believing things that are then just untrue. Great. So we have like five minutes. I'm going to rush into the immersive technology section. I knew this would happen, but this is a psychedelics conference. So I wanted to delve a bit deeper into psychedelics. But uh, the unique thing about immersive technology is that it can increase the prediction error in brains, similar to psychedelics. We don't currently have uh, the ability to specifically diffuse biases, but we can increase the prediction error enough to help you remodel biases and uh, increase learning rates. Now, the more senses we stimulate, the more influence we can have on the brain, similar to like the rubber hand experiment, right? Now, if I put people in VR headsets and now I'm controlling not only what they see, we think of VR as seeing, but it's actually about interacting and moving your body in there, getting proprioception data, I can start influencing your brain to a very high degree. Uh, and we can use this technology to simulate and research some of the effects we see in psychedelics, for instance, synesthesia and even um, ego death. So I want to uh, showcase that, um, one of uh, the creators in the VR space that is specifically uh, has been focused on retraining our biases. Her name is Clarama. Um, I will also uh, put it out there that I, I helped her in one, in one of her um, um, experiences, which is it's really amazing to see how uh, she's one of the most driven and really a mentor for me. Uh, and she has uh, an early experience she made as part of her university where you can actually embody a black man's body, right? be there and then see what it's like to receive uh, racial biases against you. She was, I think, one of the first people doing this. This is from years ago. Uh, and since then, she's created an experience called Teacher's Lens that actually lets you uh, make believe you're a teacher and test your implicit bias, where you can um, uh, choose which questions which child gets to answer and you can really test how you are biased. You're, we all are. And it's just a, a really important thing for us to confront and see the data for ourselves so we can start fixing it. Um, so in the last uh, uh, one minute, I want to tell you about what I'm doing um, in this field. Uh, I'm building a platform that's called Mew. It's a new type of social communication that's based on body language. Uh, I miss, especially now with COVID, I miss dancing with my friends so much. Uh, a lot of my friends were anyway international and I, I kept moving around through my life. So uh, I've been missing that forever. Um, and that's why I built this communication platform that will let me create different types of movements, share them with people, and actually even embody their own digital bodies. So I can get into a body of an expert mover. This was a, also part of my research in academia. Can I teach people uh, new movement skills by putting them in the bodies of expert movers? Um, a lot of these ideas are also based on um, ideas from like T Terence McKenna's work. How can we actually share, share deeper parts of ourselves, not just verbal parts. We're very good at sharing stories and words, um, but there's so much more to this brain, so much more. Um, and we're the first communication platform that's trying to allow people to actually share their internal representations, their dreamlike creations by using movements and avatars to actually be able to send parts of your brain. I think that's like my biggest dream is really to let people plug into my dream states and understand me better. And I truly believe I will understand people better when I can get access to that data from their brains. So this is um, what I'm building. Uh, we got some awesome feedback from some um, really amazing people in the field. It's still in a beta type phase, but uh, we would like to invite all of you on Thursday at 12 p.m. PST. I know a lot of you are in New York, so it's like 3, 3 p.m. Uh, your time for an interactive uh, demo with us. Uh, I'll put it uh, in the chat or somebody will, will figure out how to get the information to you. Um, and I'd also like to invite you uh, specifically, we've opened a crowdfunding, crowdfunding platform, uh, currently open only to this community um, at better rates. I, I'm not allowed for whatever legal reasons to tell you exactly what you get for how much money, but anybody can invest for as little as $100 to help us continue to build this platform. And if you have any questions, I would love for you to contact me.
and we might have a few minutes for questions. Who's there? Sarah, thank you so much for sharing. It was awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, really wonderful to hear. Really excited for your session. Um, Folks, uh, this is the crowdfunding campaign we've been talking about, so please make sure uh, to go check it out. You can have a piece of the psychedelics ecosystem for as little as $100 and investing in a really impact-focused, uh, driven, incredible startup uh, called MiU. So uh, please do so. Um, let's see if there are uh, any questions. I don't think we have any, and it is uh, time for us to yep. transition. Uh, but Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing uh, information with me, everyone. This was uh, really awesome to switch things around a bit. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.